Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a friendly welcome from the Detroit Free Press and radio station WJR to another In Our Opinion program. But before we get into the In Our Opinion program this afternoon, here are the latest dispatches from Vichy on the African situation. According to Vichy, American troops are holding Safi, south of Casablanca in French Morocco, and a large beachhead at Medea, north of the port of Rabat. Vichy says a large number of transports appear to be landing troops at both places. And the Vichy Bureau of Information claims two British and two American ships have been sunk in an attack on the harbor of Oran. The Vichy dispatches are not confirmed by other sources. American forces evidently are making progress in their campaign to occupy French colonies in North Africa and to open a second front against the Axis. That's the one clear fact that emerges from a welter of reports and rumors from many sources on the electrifying move by our forces. Washington has not yet issued detailed news on development since the first announcement that American forces were landing in French North Africa. Dispatches from Vichy make it clear this morning that American forces have landed on both sides of several key points on both the Atlantic and Mediterranean coasts of French possessions in North Africa. Our landing forces presumably are driving forward in an effort to capture these key positions. Late word from Vichy this morning is that Algiers itself is under attack. Landings also have been made at Safi on the Atlantic coast of Morocco. Vichy says Safi has been captured by the Americans. The Vichy radio says a key at the port of Algiers is burning fiercely, presumably from a fire started by shells from an American destroyer. And American troops landed from a destroyer are said to have captured the Admiralty at Algiers, but were themselves taken prisoner in a French counterattack. And Algiers' dispatch adds that five American planes scored several bomb hits on the Admiralty, but anti-aircraft guns brought down one plane. And two British and two American ships are reported to have been sunk in the harbor of Oran. Those are a few of the many and varied reports of the situation. And now for In Our Opinion. <coughs> if you drive an automobile, you'll be vitally interested in this afternoon's roundtable discussion because we're going to talk about gasoline rationing. There's a strong feeling here in Detroit and in the Detroit metropolitan area that gasoline rationing is unworkable here, that our transportation system can't absorb the load, that the war effort will be bogged down unless workers can get to and from their jobs and their automobiles. There are a lot of other arguments against gasoline rationing, most of which you will hear in just a few moments. And there are a lot of answers to these arguments, which you will also hear right from headquarters. The man with the answers is John R. Richards, a young man with a very big job down in Washington, the job of supervising gasoline rationing throughout the entire United States. Mr. Richards is particularly familiar with the Detroit situation, having been head of the Division of Student Personnel at Wayne University here for five years before going down to the nation's capital. The man with the questions is Raymond Berry, Detroit attorney and head of the Detroit Board of Commerce. Mr. Berry is accustomed to asking searching questions, and he plans to do a lot of searching this afternoon. Also on the bombardment committee this afternoon is Royce Howes, military commentator of the Detroit Free Press. And George Cushing, news editor of WJR, is again the moderator. This is Bud Guest telling George Cushing to take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not going to waste any time on preliminaries today. I do think before we get into the general discussion that Mr. Richards should state briefly just what his job is in Washington with respect to the gasoline rationing situation. Mr. Richards. Mr. Cushing, I am chief of the gasoline rationing branch of OPA, which is part of the mileage rationing program. As you know, we have been ordered by the War Production Board and by the rubber director, Mr. Jeffers, to ration gasoline for the purpose of saving rubber. We have a four-point program, in fact. We have a program of tire replacement, a program of tire inspection, a program of speed control, and finally, the only way to control mileage, which is through gasoline rationing. Well, now, Mr. Berry, as president <laughs> of the Detroit Board of Commerce, will you give your views briefly on this rationing program? Mr. Cushing, I would like to outline the position of the Detroit Board of Commerce. I would like to make a few remarks specifically for Mr. Richards. The Detroit Board of Commerce operates through a group of committees. It is non-political. In fact, I do not know the politics of any man on our board of directors. I assure you, Mr. Richards and Washington, that any activity engaged in or indulged in by the Detroit Board of Commerce is not with the purpose in mind of embarrassing anyone. We have a job to do. We are going to do it as best we can. We are concerned in this matter because we are 100% behind the administration's effort to win this war. The United States is a democracy. No better example could be given. 
the enslaved peoples of the world what democracy means and the right to favor or disagree on principles of government, whether expressed through voting or a discussion such as this this afternoon, neither of which is possible in the Axis nations. True democracy presupposes that we, will, that we will be honest, a purpose, and sincere in our effort. The American people are intelligent, honest, and sincere, and can be trusted. They can and will willingly accept the hardship occasioned by war. Give us a chance to accept some of these hardships voluntarily, in preference to a directive from Washington. Voluntary acceptance will go much farther in building a morale than will compulsory acceptance and the voluntary acceptance of hardships will culminate, will assist in culminating the war much faster and remove many hardships that will be placed upon us un unnecessarily. Give us a chance. The old adage, you can drive a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, would seem to be in point here. Detroit Board, Board of Commerce urges, in connection with this problem of gas rationing, several things. First, we ask that you defer the effective date for 90 days to permit consideration of some alternate plans. Those alternate plans may be such as creating districts, eliminate, possibly eliminate Sunday driving after 12 o'clock at noon, eliminate driving after 7 o'clock in the evening, perhaps reduce the speed limit to 30 days. The automobile means more to the average American family than most all other essential commodities. I predict that if a poll were taken that would disclose that the people would accept rationing of meat, sugar, coffee, clothing, and other commodities more readily than his automobile, and will, will accept a reasonable restraint upon the use of his automobile. The automobile in this state is first an essential, and secondly, a luxury. Well, <coughs> Mr. Berry, I think you have hit something there when you referred to the rationing of other commodities in contrast with the rationing of the motor car. Uh, <coughs> this country can operate without coffee. We could even operate without sugar. The British are operating without a great many things that uh, we still consider absolutely ne necessary. But the automobile is woven into the very fabric of this country. It's a fundamental of the transportation system. Now, its elimination is not <coughs> taking away a luxury. It's taking away a means of conducting the country's business. And just now, the business is war. Uh, you can place certain limitations on its use. But uh, frankly, I don't see how anything as drastic as the gas rationing plan that's projected can work. Now, Mr. Richards, before this program opened, I said that I thought that uh, the gas rationing procedure here would last a week or two weeks and then would have to be thrown overboard because of its failure, the fact that it would uh, paralyze war industries and one thing or another. And you said that it was working in other places. Let me ask you whether it's working in any place uh, similar to Detroit in geographical layout and in general transportation facilities. You can say the camel works in Khyber Pass, but that has nothing to do with Detroit. Now, it may work in Buffalo, it may work in Manhattan, it may work in Brooklyn, it may work in Boston. But will it work in uh, Los Angeles? Will it work in Detroit? Uh, will it work in any city that's had its major growth since the, uh, the since the automobile came in and therefore has no great transportation system? Mr. Howes, I think it's probably more important uh, to in Detroit <coughs> that we conserve our transportation mileage than in uh, many other cities of which we know. Uh, it's true that gasoline rationing is working in Buffalo. It's also true that the Buffalo Chamber of Commerce made exactly the same points about uh, its situation in Buffalo as you and Mr. Barry are making this morning. However, I think you will find that the program of transportation rationing, which we have installed in the Buffalo area, actually is working, and that the aircraft plants have not been hampered particularly. Uh, before we go on any further, I think it's uh, necessary that we recognize that transportation, as we know it, is gone. That if we drive as usual, one out of every three of our tires will be worn out by March, and two out of three by the end of the year. Our program is to save these tires, to recap them so that they will not be ruined, and to keep 27 million cars rolling <laughs> in this country. It's probably more important 
that transportation rationing work here than in New York, Boston, and places with rapid transit facilities. Well, that's a, <coughs> a sound enough theory, but can you tell me this? Uh, how does the square mile area of Buffalo and its suburbs compare with the square mile area of Detroit and its suburbs, and what is the ca relative capacity of the uh, two public transportation systems serving those areas? Do you have any figures on that, or are you just guessing that it'll work here? I didn't bring figures with me. Let's see. Uh, the Buffalo area would be smaller in everything that you mentioned, probably, except transportation. I think you will find that public transportation here in Detroit is more adequate than that in the Buffalo area. Well, uh, it's true in this area that a uh, 20-mile drive each way to work is nothing for a worker. 30 miles is not to be regarded as at all uncommon. Royce, there are about 350,000 that drive their cars to and from work in Detroit, and they live in about 14,000 blocks spread over 320 square miles. Uh, take this case, Mr. Richards. A man lives out in Redford and works at Continental Motor Works, or Hudson, drives clear across town five, six days a week. Is he going to be able to get enough gas to do that? Yes, sir. The local board will look at the facts and if a war worker needs 100 miles a day driving alone in his car, he will be given that mileage by his board. Well, now, just where do, why do you make that statement? Is that going to be a written direction to these rationing boards to uh, give them a, a so-called congressional X card to give them unlimited gas? The Is there any rule now that uh, lays that lays that principle down? Mr. Barry, I think I could say that the boards have uh, no rules from Washington which would uh, bind them in such a case. The rationing power has been placed in the hands of your committees of neighbors right here in Detroit, people who know how crowded your buses are and how your streetcars run. <laughs> they are free to give whatever mileage is needed by a war worker to get to and from his work. Well, now, would you explain one more thing to me? I'm very much confused about the whole thing. I understand that we are using the gasoline to ration rubber, that there is no shortage of gasoline. Second, there's a confusion in my mind as to what constitutes a war worker. Now, to me, 95% of the people in this area are engaged directly or indirectly in war work. I'll take the man that is uh, delivering, or the boy that's delivering newspapers to my house. I'll take the radio man. I'll take the man that's running a small meat market or a grocery store or any other uh, businessman. And I'll say he is directly or indirectly engaged in war work, although he may not be making shells. Now, what is the definition of a war worker? Uh, your opinion, I think, is quite right. The war worker is only one of the 15 groups of people who are eligible for preferred or unlimited mileage as needed. We recognize that the essential workers in the civilian economy <coughs> are just as important, probably, as the war worker as such. Well, then, does that mean that he will get an unlimited card, the same as a man that is working behind a lathe? It is the intention of the program to provide all essential occupational mileage for people to get to and from their work and to drive in the course of their work. It's true that some of the less essential civilian pursuits are held in by a ceiling and by certain tests of car sharing and alternative transportation. That being true, Mr. Richards, then it is my contention that gasoline rationing in this district, in this area, is not necessary. When you speak of necessary, Mr. Barry, I wonder if we couldn't look at the nature of the commodity we're rationing. We're rationing rubber, which is quite different from steel, zinc, and high-octane gasoline, of which there are also shortages. You, as a man familiar with industry, uh, know that we have a huge capacity in steel and zinc and high-octane gasoline, that we can maintain a huge and powerful army with these commodities, in spite of the fact that there are shortages once in a while. However, we do not have enough rubber supply to maintain even a third-rate army. 
Our army is dependent more upon rubber than upon any other commodity and has already cut itself very deeply in rubber use. That means that for every pound of rubber we can save in this civilian program, our tanks and our airplanes and our battleships will be better. Well, it will be true that they'll be better if we can build the tanks and the planes and the airships and whatnot to put the rubber in. But uh, it seems to me you're approaching a program that in a good many centers is just going to stop the, the uh, percentage on those things. We might as well use the rubber to make slingshots if we're not going to make weapons uh, that are a little more mechanized than that. Here, uh, supposing this thing actually becomes effective here, which it probably will, there'll be the usual amount of confusion, the usual uh, attitude of the local board that its uh, primary mission is not to keep the show running but to deprive you of something. That's usually the outlook of the rationing board, that uh, uh, we're giving away something that belongs to us personally, and uh, we don't want to do that, rather than taking the broad view that we're supposed to uh, spread this stuff so that the economic machine will work. Well, now I contend that it'll break down very shortly, and it'll break down in a way that will mean loss of manpower hours. Here, you're, you're taking extra tires away from a little fellow now. Uh, the fellow who drives a jalopy and has seven or eight old, worn-out carcasses, any one of which may blow at any minute. He uh, takes his share of the ride people to the factory with him this morning on his five tires, and he blows one out. So he puts that in the <coughs> shop, and the man says, well, due to a shortage of labor and one thing and another having to do with a war, uh, I can't get it vulcanized till a week from next Thursday. So he puts his spare on, and Wednesday afternoon, that goes bang. And then there are three tires, and there are no share of the rides, and there's a car bogged down by the side of the road for two weeks. And where does that lead to? In production terms, if those share of the ride folks, when they get to the factory, or don't get to it. I think you've really struck the point there, and that is that that man's transportation has been endangered not by gasoline rationing, but by Japanese jungle fighters who have taken the supply of rubber. Now, to date... I might throw in there that it's also been endangered by some people who failed to provide for that supply of rubber about the time the Jap jungle fighters started work. <laughs> yes, that's true, but we can't make up past mistakes by making another. Actually, we have replaced only one-eighth of the rubber worn off <coughs> since Pearl Harbor, and tires are in pretty bad shape. In fact, they're in such bad shape that we are about to ruin millions of tire carcasses by overwear. Now, if you will help us, we will guarantee an OPA to replace all rubber worn off cars on essential driving. We will issue different tires for every worker whose tires reach the recapping point. That is just the constructive part of our program, you see. Unless you permit us to take those tires, recap them, and keep them rolling on a controlled program, why our tire carcasses will be ruined, and one-third of our cars will be off of the road by April. Our intention in this program is to put back two million cars on the road, which are already off. Well, now, what is essential driving? This has been touched on before, but we're going to have a man take his car and go out to one of our plants, and he's going to spend the day making a tank. Then he's coming home, and he's going to want pork chops. But unfortunately, the butcher had used up his A-card uh, gasoline the first two days of the week, so there aren't any pork chops. Now, is the man who sells the pork chops to the, world, to the war worker any less vital than the worker himself? Isn't it all a team that has to be kept operating? You've got to have uh, girls behind counters in restaurants. You've got to have boys running elevators. Uh, if your ordinance people down here in the Union Guardian building have to walk up 40 floors, it's going to slow things up. But if the elevator boys, uh, for some reason, can't get there because you take their gasoline away, now that's exaggerated, but it, it uh, well, I don't an mean indication that's of how it, it dovetails. The, the whole thing is mashed right in together. You can't take one without all. I don't believe that's exaggerated in the least. I, I say that every business in this community is essential. And I make that, without exception, a le straight legitimate business. I like to ask Mr. Richards this question. If we are to conserve rubber, and this is another point of confusion in my mind, and I imagine it's confusing others, 
If we are rationing gasoline for the purpose of saving rubber, then why are we rationing gasoline to power boats all over the country? When a survey shows that the power boats consume less than three-tenths of one percent of the national production of petroleum last year. Now, if we are conserving rubber, why not let the man that has a power boat use all the gasoline he wants? Uh, there are several uh, small corrections there. In the first place, we, we are not cutting commercial power boating in any way, merely pleasure boating. And we are doing it only... the tires on the pleasure boat? Well, we are doing it only in the 30 states which the Office of Petroleum Coordinator says have oil transportation problems. There, he, of course, is the expert. If he declares that there's a shortage in 30 states, we obviously cannot permit unlimited supplies of gasoline for motor boating. However, gasoline is not rationed to motor boats in the 18 states where there is no transportation shortage. Well, we're, they're rationed to the Great Lakes area, and we do not have a shortage. Now, here's one more confusing question. Someone in Washington, I don't know what department, has reduced the speculation in prospecting for crude oil from one well on 20 acres of land to one well per 40 acres of land. Now, that is cutting the prospecting in half, thereby reducing the quantity possible to obtain for making fuel oil and gasoline. Well, now, <clears throat> we're way out of my backyard, Mr. Barry. I, that, this whole thing is the Office of Petroleum Coordinator, of which we have <coughs> no jurisdiction. Well, Mr. Richards, let's get back to uh, how this measure is going to put those two million cars on the road that are not on the road now. That would be interesting for the that, record. I think that is a point that is often missed, and that is that the primary purpose of the new transportation plan is to release tires automatically to people on the basis of their occupational mileage. Now, if you have laid up a car because you can't get tires and have customarily used it in your business or in your occupation, you automatically get recaps as soon as your tires reach that point. And if your tires cannot be recapped, you get new tires. And tires are given entirely on the basis of the number of miles that must be driven. Well, here, but uh, a few minutes ago, you were going to put a, a restriction on the number of miles that can be driven. Uh, we can, can't we just say to the man who needs recaps, why, you're in a category that isn't entitled to drive, so you don't get recaps. I'm, I'm not arguing about the man going out to the golf club. Uh, I'm arguing about the man who sells insurance or hardware or a lot of other things that, incidentally, war workers need. Oh, he'll get tires. That's our purpose. Oh, well, then everybody gets tires, huh? It is not exactly tires for all. It's, uh, it's tires for those people who have uh, occupational mileage over a certain point. We will issue tires to them regardless of their occupation, but the price a person must pay for that is this rigid control over the use of those tires. Mr. Richards, let me suggest this to you as a, as a matter of consideration in this matter. Uh, you're perhaps too young to recall the last war, but we had a very serious epidemic known as the flu as a result of improper health conditions arising out of perhaps lack of transportation. That is possible again if we are going to crowd all the war workers or all the people of Detroit in our, street, our present streetcars, which are inadequate, and our buses, which are inadequate. We have a health problem. Uh, the automobile does afford some recreation and relief for the war worker or for the office worker. Now, if uh, we are going to deprive these people of all recreation, uh, submit them to the rigorous, rigorous weather that we have in the North, my point is that we will seriously retire the war effort, and that is the most important. Now, what difference does it make whether you use rubber on tires or whether you use rubber otherwise so long as it contributes directly to the war effort. Are you suggesting that uh, the recreational automobile driving uh, contributes directly to I, the war effort? I am, I am I'm making this statement that even a war worker 
A man behind the lathe is entitled and should have some recreation, and he shouldn't have to spend anywhere from two to four hours a day in public conveyances getting to and from his work. It destroys his efficiency. He can get recreation out of his automobile, whether he's driving to and from work. And I'll go a step farther. I'll say that I think that a man is entitled to some recreation. How is he going to get to the movie? Are we going to close those up? I would say that a moving picture or any theater is indirectly engaged in war work because it contributes to the welfare and the morale of the people of this community. I think we have two points there. The one is overcrowded transportation. And I would say that your local boards uh, are not forced by any regulation we're imposing on Detroit to put more people on your buses and streetcars. Your boards can declare that they are inadequate for further load and can then issue gasoline to people because they have no alternative means to their well, car. Well, not just how would these boards here, you have some 25 or 30, I believe, how would they impose uh, or issue a decree that would force the city of Detroit to su supply the suburban area with transportation? I don't see how that would work. You see, we're rationing gasoline even in towns without a single bus or streetcar. Our purpose is to keep 27 million cars rolling, you see. Ours is a transportation conservation plan. Mr. We want them to be used. Mr. Berry, there's one point that hasn't been discussed here today, and that's the share of the ride program. Uh, <coughs> does your office, Mr. Richards, recognize that as an imperative necessity? Yes, and one of the cheering things in my visit around the country was to meet with 1,200 war transportation planners from Detroit plants uh, this week. Now, these men are prepared with plans to form car clubs, swap ride systems in Detroit plants. And I would say that Detroit is probably better prepared than any city I have visited to set up these car clubs, due partly to your fine leadership in OWT. There's a, uh, a matter of figures that <laughs> I'd like to call to your attention. You uh, uh, people are estimating that through the share ride plan, which is a splendid plan and all that, but I'm merely pointing out a basis on which you're likely to go awry. You're saying that uh, rather than have five people drive five cars five days a week, we'll have uh, each of those cars operate one day a week. Well, actually, it's going to work out to each of those cars operating two days a week. Uh, in most cases, because the added mileage in this taxi system runs that up. And I just throw that in as, uh, as a statistic to consider when you're estimating what you're saving and what you're spending, because you're not cutting from the mileage the cars that are uh, entirely the amount represented by the cars lying in the garages. You're, I, I know of a number of instances uh, where mileage just about doubled on a given car to accommodate Mr. people. Mr. Richard, do you, do you believe that there is a possibility that Detroit may be given a deferment of 90 days or any period? Mr. Henderson and Mr. Jeffers have within the last few days pointed out that we have constructed a plan that we are ready we have a trained staff in Detroit, and that our tanks, the tanks which will save the rubber tires in this community, are ready to roll. I'm convinced that Detroit is ready, and I think there will be no deferment, sir. Well, I disagree with you on Detroit being ready. I don't, no, I don't I see don't any that effort either. that indicates that Detroit is ready. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to have to break this up. We could go on like this all afternoon, I'm sure. But you've been listening to the In Our Opinion program, a public service feature of the Detroit Free Press and radio station WJR. Join us again next Sunday afternoon at 12.30 for another roundtable discussion of a timely subject. This is Bud Guest speaking, and this is WJR, the Goodwill Station, Detroit.